Good morning, Frontline. For those of you that I've not met, my name is uh, Mark Ciro. I, I try and uh, make sure we adequately pass high fives out here at the door. So uh, if I haven't given you a chance to get a high five from you, I, I'll try and find you afterwards give you a high five. But, but that's one of the great things. So I am, uh, I am one of the, I'm your, I'm your newest elder. And uh, here at Frontline, and if you see the sign when you walk in, we kind of want to look at things as being real and relational. And I tell you, this is the first time I've ever stood here, so wow. First time I've ever preached, so double wow. And it feels pretty darn real right about now. It's a little more real an hour and a half ago when I was doing the first service, but wow. What a fantastic opportunity. That's part of what Pastor Gary does to challenge the elders. And if you hadn't heard, all of the elders, all of your elders, are out doing ministry today to spread the gospel. And that's pretty darn fantastic that we have. So I just want to say thank you for that. Now, I kind of want to start off with this uh, kind of a cool video. So I'd ask uh, Steve, if you would, to, to play the video. We'll just watch the last few minutes, last few seconds of it. All right, anybody recognize the TV show? No. <laughs> That's good. That means you've not gained enough life experience yet. That was February 1969, what's called the Ed, Ed Sullivan Show. It was the precursor to kind of like Johnny Carson. And if you don't have enough life experience to know that show, then maybe David Letterman or something even more current. It was a novelty show. It's where Elvis Presley... And the Beatles made their American debut, right? And you can see the guy was dressed in his uh, pink, uh, so it was Valentine's Day weekend, so it was his pink tux. So why would I start, why would I start with a video about, it wasn't for the music, about spinning plates, right? Because in life, a lot of us quite often feel our plate is full, our plate is spinning, right? And we're just a little bit from having an unstable, wobbly plate that comes crashing to the ground, even if we have a stick, a pillar that we call faith. And that's kind of what we're going to talk about today. What do we do to keep our plate from crashing to the ground? See? That's kind of where we're going. So, so now, the principle of that, and I love science. I'm a science kind of guy. And you may have remember this from flashback, depending on how, again, how experienced you are in life. But uh, you may remember the laws of Newton. Something that's act upon continue to do that act, continues to do that motion until it stops. This is called the principle of the conservation of angular momentum. And there's a picture up here of different ways that we use that principle quite often. When a skater goes from this and skates slowly to this and skates very quickly, that's based on the principle of, of conservation of angular momentum, right? Gyros for airplanes, spinning of rifled bullets to keep them more accurate. All that is based on that same principle, right? But what things work? Why does the plate slow down? Why does the bowl start wobbling? It's because of friction. It's because of friction, right? Life has friction. We all experience friction. Some friction is good. Some friction is bad. Understand? When you learn to ride a bike, the conservation of angular momentum, the faster you go, the easier it is to pedal. But you're really thankful that you have friction of the brakes to stop you, right? You're, you're, you're thankful for that. So life has friction, both good and bad. That's what causes the plate to start to slow down and eventually the plate to wobble and hopefully not to fall off. See? In the series that we're in right now, we've been talking about uh, uh, out of the book of Philippians, and we're in Second Philippians today. And as we kind of think through 
what it means to have a spinning plate, I think it ties directly to where we are with this kind of motif. If you remember, Pastor Gary came up with this idea, and the lessons that we are in while we're in Philippians is about taking life by the throat. And the picture that you see is a picture of a man's arms and prison bars, okay? And they kind of seem to be in contradiction, but that's perfect, right? When we talk about taking life by the throat, we are talking about looking at ways to overcome friction. And that person who's represented in those prison bars is the same person who penned Philippians. It's the Apostle Paul. And he's writing from inside of prison. And he is, God, if you will, life has him by the throat, but he's talking to us about how to take life by the throat. He's talking about us how to overcome life's frictions. Before we open and kind of start talking about the passage of Scripture today, let's go to prayer. Dear God, just thank you so much for today. Thank you for the challenge and the nervousness that you've got inside of me, but thank you that you have already figured out the words that I'm going to say, and you already know the people that are here to kind of hear those words, what, what those words will be to kind of hopefully change my life, their life, our lives, as we walk together to honor you, to serve you, as we kind of acknowledge that you are our creator and our savior. We ask you to go with us. We ask that you kind of use us to be your instruments. In Jesus' name, amen. So I'd ask you, if you would, with me to open the Bible to, uh, to Philippians, and we're going to pick up from uh, around chapter 2. Now, if you were here last week, it's towards the end of the Bible. If you were here last week, you may have heard about uh, Josh. And Josh spoke to us last week uh, about the idea of, of obeying God who works in us, through us, on us, to make a perfect purpose. And as we obey God, and as we encounter life's frictions, we're supposed to do that without grumbling. That's tough. It's tough not to grumble when our plate is spinning and starting to wobble. Okay? Maybe it's too full, maybe it's imbalanced, whatever it would be, but a plate starts, no matter how your faith is, no matter how strong that center pillar is, no matter how big your rod is. By the way, I brought a plate today, but I wasn't going to demonstrate. So, uh, you know, it is Valentine's Day, and I don't want to, I don't want to kind of, you know, you know, in the English language, in the English language, it's the only language where you can skate on thin water, or oh, I just my stove. You can skate on thin ice and land in hot water. So I'm not going to spin my wife's plate today. But uh, I just want to tell you that essentially, as we start to open this passage of scripture, I'm going to call draw our attention to second, I'm sorry, Philippians chapter two, verse seventeen. The first few words of that. But even if I am being poured out like a drink offering. We'll stop right there for just a second. This is Paul, a pillar of faith, who is in prison. Okay? Now, Paul is in a Roman prison. He's been in a Roman prison for a little while. And he is facing a lot of friction. I like to think that he's in a, what we would call, my wife and I just came back from Rome. And we stayed in a four-star hotel. Right, in Rome. Paul is what we would like to say is called staying in a five rats prison. If you spell star backward, you get the word rats. Right? He's staying in a five rats. In Rome's prisons were notorious for rats. But what he's talking about up there is not celebrating the fact that he's in prison per se. He's talking about being martyred, being killed. The drink offering he's referring to goes back to the Old Testament. And the idea of being killed, sacrificed, if you will, that's what he's referring to. So Paul is experiencing a lot of friction. Paul's plate is wobbling, if you will. So that's kind of where we are. But what does Paul do about it? And that's what makes Philippians such a great book, such a great thank you letter. If you read the rest of that up there, it says, On the sacrifice and service coming from your faith, I am glad and rejoice with all of you. So you should be glad and rejoice with me. Paul's rejoicing while he's in prison. He's rejoicing and not grumbling. How in the world can Paul rejoice while he is in prison? How? That's tough. I mean, I know when my things get started, when my faith gets shaken a little bit, I'm saying, I start to think about, I start to grumble, let's face it. 
I start to think about those things. I'm not ready to rejoice, right? But how is he rejoicing? And that's what we're going to find out. The first thing that's very obvious is Paul is a man of great faith. Paul is a man of great faith. The story of Paul goes all the way back to, you can look at, there's several versions, but you can look at Acts chapter 26, right? Paul was a man of great faith. He was converted from Saul to Paul on the road to Damascus. Many of us know the story. The bottom line, he was a man of great faith. And he believes in the same faith that I believe in, the same faith that most of you believe in, that Christ, our Creator, our God, came to earth in the form of man as a perfect example of how we can be to live his life, to ultimately take all of our sins, including my sins, to the cross, to die on the cross as a sacrifice for my sins, your sins, our sins, to be raised three days later, and then to go to heaven so that he can welcome us home at some point in the future. That's the faith that gives Paul that center pillar. That is the big pillar upon which Paul's plate spins, even in prison. But that doesn't change the fact that he's still having to face that he's in prison, that he's still this close to being martyred, this close to being killed for his faith. And what gives him the ability to rejoice is something that I think all of us can take advantage of. Because all of us will be challenged in our faith. All of us will feel like life's friction is working against us, whether it's health, whether it's at home, whether it's work, whether it's even here in the church. There's friction amongst us, right? There are things that counteract the preservation of our angular momentum, the preservation of our faith, right? And Paul knows that. But the beautiful thing about our Creator, about our God, is that he gives us something else beyond faith, something else that each one of us can take advantage of. And Paul has two of them with him. Paul has two of them with him. And for that, we're going to move on and look at Philippians 2, verses 19 through 30. And I'm going to read them to you. I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you that I may also be cheered when I receive news about you. I have no one else like him who will show genuine concern for your welfare, for everyone looks out for their own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. But you know that Timothy has proved himself because as a son with his father, he has served with me in the work of the gospel. I hope, therefore, to send him as soon as I can see how things go with me, and I am confident in the Lord that I myself will come soon. But I think it is necessary to send back to you Epaphroditus, my brother, co-worker, and fellow soldier, who is also your messenger, whom you sent to take care of my needs. For he longs for all of you and is distressed because you heard he was ill. Indeed, he was ill and almost died. But God had mercy on him, and not only on him, but also on me, to spare me sorrow upon sorrow. Therefore, I am more eager to send him, so that when you see him again, you may be glad and have less anxiety." So then I welcome him in the Lord with great joy. So then welcome him in the Lord with great joy and honor people like him because he almost died for the work of Christ. He risked his life to make up for the help you yourselves cannot give. What Paul had, in addition to his pillar of faith, Paul had two close, intimate friends. Two close, intimate friends. And that's what our passage today is about. And that's what we're going to talk. So let's start with Timothy. Ah, Timothy. I I challenge you to look at the the verses 19 to 24, but kind of focus in on verse 22. What does he call Timothy? A son. Thank you, a son, right? A son like a son to his father. Okay, a son. Now the life and connection between Paul and Timothy goes back to before he actually even went to Philippi the first time. Okay. Acts 16, Paul was traveling on a missionary journey and he came and found Timothy. And Paul elected to adopt Timothy like a son. Paul was a religious leader. He was a great orator. He was a man of phenomenal faith. And he adopted Timothy as a son. He develops Timothy 
all throughout his lifetime. Timothy becomes, if you will, Paul's prodigy. Later in Timothy's life, Paul's going to write to him the letter first and second Timothy, and he's going to essentially hand the baton of his ministry over to Timothy. Right? That's how close Timothy was as a friend to Paul. Okay? That's the first kind of concept, the friend, close friends, intimate friends, friends that you call family. Okay? When Paul's faith is being shaken, he's got somebody as close as Timothy that he calls a son. Okay? That's a friend, a friend indeed. But more than that, that's not really all that's unique about Paul's life. I mean, Paul's had these kind of relationships way back from the beginning. If you go back and remember the story when he visits Philippi, he's arrested and he's put in jail. And you remember the Sunday school story where he's shackled up with Silas and it's uh, late at night and they're belting out the first version of Jailhouse Rock, which became later popular by some guy named Elvis. You know what I'm saying? And at midnight, God answers prayers and shakes the prison open and breaks the shackles. Right? Paul's had these friends. He's had Timothy. At that time, he had Silas with him. Okay? In order to restore faith. When it gets tough, friends intimate friends, bring about that to which overcomes friction. Okay? And that's the beautiful thing about this relationship with Timothy. But why is Timothy so unique to get the call of son? I mean, son in, those, in that culture, son was somebody who inherited or who had the namesake. Right? I've already kind of alluded, son, he was going to send Timothy as his emissary. He sends Timothy to Corinth to solve a problem later in life. You know I'm saying? That's how important, that's how much he sees himself as Paul's, or sorry, as, as Timothy's mentor. As to develop Timothy into being somebody that can follow in his ministry. Right? But what makes Timothy unique? What makes, so of course he's got the same faith, but that's not what makes Timothy so unique that, that he would become called a son in the situation that Paul is facing right now in prison. What makes Timothy so unique is what you'll find in verse 20 and 21. Looking at verses 20 and 21, I have no one else like him who will show genuine concern for your welfare, for everyone looks out for their own interest, not those of Jesus Christ. Timothy had genuine concern for the interests of others. He wasn't focused on himself. He was focused on that which strengthens others. Genuine concern. Those are pretty strong words from the Apostle Paul. You know what I'm saying? Pretty strong words. That is a friend that is so intimate to be called a son. Okay? So when we think about Timothy and you think about the fact that he looked out for others' interests, he also looked out for one person chief among them all. And that's at the end of the sentence, Jesus Christ. Right? He shared Paul's faith and he shared Paul's conviction to look out for the welfare genuinely of other people, right? That's a bond that anyone would love to have in a friend, a friend intimately enough to be called a son. Now, a lot of us have kids, and there's nothing better than when we have a kid and we watch our kid do something, especially when we're not, like, right beside him, we're at a distance, and we watch our, we watch our kid do something that is just spontaneously an act of pure goodness, you know, maybe it's sharing a cookie with somebody. Maybe it's giving up. A, maybe it's giving up a seat in the subway. You've seen that? You seen? Just things that you know that you didn't tell him to do. He just did it on his own, right? Our son. We have a son in college. Recently, took a couple of underprivileged kids to dinner. We didn't. He didn't tell us. You're saying? Just did that on his own dime. I mean, we funneled money back to him afterwards to cover the cost. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But it was kind of neat for us to see that from a distance. You know what I'm saying? When those things happen, it's because of. It's not because of the work necessarily, but it's because of what comes from the inside, right? It's the idea that the Holy Spirit is working on us to make us better, right? And that is the kind of genuine concern for the welfare of others and for the interests of Jesus Christ that Timothy displayed routinely to Paul, okay? That's what makes Timothy get the title of a son from just being a friend, okay? But Timothy had one of the things that, uh, that uh, also was just something that Paul was amazed by. 
And if you go to verse 22, it's written in verse 22. But you know that Timothy has proved himself because as a son to his father, he has served with me in the work of the gospel. We all know that Paul was quite challenged. Friction in his life. I mean, sanctions, shipwrecks, snake bites, those things were all things that Paul had. Floggings, again, all captured in the book of Acts. You can read it. He gives a list twice. See? But if you notice, if you hadn't thought about before, Timothy is with Paul throughout almost all of that. Right? Timothy is with Paul throughout. That is a friend that is so close to the son. Timothy, is, Timothy was adopted by Paul, if you will, for the ministry, and he continues with them all the way through to the very end. Okay? So Timothy was there. He persevered with Paul. He's in prison with Paul. He's facing the same friction in life. Life has Timothy by the throat, just like it has Paul by the throat. Right? And that's why Paul can say, this is my son. He's such a friend that I would consider him to be close enough in my family to, to be called my son. That is pretty amazing. So Timothy was tried and tested just like Paul. But there's a second person, too. A little bit different than Timothy. And that's in verse, starting in verses 19. And his name, and I love his name, his name is Epaphroditus. Matter of fact, if Elaine and I have another kid, we're naming him Epaphroditus. I said that this morning at the 9 o'clock service because my wife didn't see this, you know, ahead of time, and I got the old. We're not planning to have any more kids. But if we have a kid, Epaphroditus, why? Because not only do I like the name Epaphroditus, you know, that's got an awesome name, I'm saying, I love how Paul describes him. How does Paul describe Epaphroditus? It's right in verse 25. But I think it necessary to send back Epaphroditus, my brother, co-worker, and fellow soldier. I love the term brother. I love how we, that just that makes you feel warm. And, I, and brother, sister, that term brother. When you go back to the first about a month ago when Pastor Gary started this season, and he, or started this sermon series, and he opened it on Philippians, right? He talked about the Band of Brothers, the HBO series, The Band of Brothers. What a great visual and audio depiction of how it is to band. A bunch of mutts and misfits that come together in Georgia, that train together, that eventually come over here in World War II. They storm the beaches of Normandy. They make it through the bocages of Brittany, and they end up being the battle works of Bastogne. Saying, what a great group of people. And they did that because they came together as a band of brothers. Now, I sometimes use that term a little bit too flippantly, to be honest with you. I sometimes throw the brother, hey, brother. It's, just, it's, kind of a, it's kind of a colloquialism, too often used. But when Paul meant it, when Paul used it, he's not using it in a slang term. He means it. Epaphroditus, my brother and fellow soldier. Right? So why would he call him his brother and fellow soldier? First and foremost, Epaphroditus is a man of faith. Tradition has it that Epaphroditus was an elder from the church of Philippi, the same church to which he's writing this thank you note back. And really, Epaphroditus is going to carry this back, as it says up there in the later verses in this section, to the church in Philippi. But he, as an elder, we don't know how old he was, but we know that he journeyed the 1,200 miles from where the church of Philippi was, carrying supplies to Rome for Paul. If you were in that five rats prison of Rome, you know, you didn't get three squares a day, right? They didn't feed you. It was on you to feed yourself, right? There was no meals ready to eat. There was no, you know, portable grub, right? You had to have people bring you supplies. So he, Epaphroditus, brings from the church of Philippi sustenance and morale-building letters to Paul. Epaphroditus is a great man of faith who is ready to go to Paul and provide Paul something that he needs. Okay? And he's there ministering to Paul. And that's one reason why we celebrate the idea of being a brother. That's the, that's the, the idea of taking care of each other. It's more, than just, it's more than just saying, hey, brother. It's really the idea of doing that next thing, which is, giving something to the person who's something in need, something that you have that you are bringing to them. Now, I know that I'm looking at a lot of soldiers, airmen, sailors, but I'm looking at a lot of soldiers in the field, right, out here in this crowd today. 
we, we kind of get that concept. We've had that experience where we've been out there and we've sat beside somebody. We've taken care of a need, right? So we kind of touch on what Paphroditus is doing, right? We understand that there are some people, many of our brothers, that we would lay our lives down, okay? That's just kind of what it is to be brothers. And if we look at Paphroditus, that essentially is what he has done, right? He has come on this journey, and along the way, the friction of life has afflicted him with some kind of illness. And when he shows up there, or after he's there for a little while with Paul, whatever it is, he almost dies like a soldier. He almost dies, okay? So much so that Paul is talking about being just overwhelmed with sorrow for that potential. So he has that closeness, that friendship, right, with Paul. And that is, I think, the second reason that we kind of think through about what it means to be called a soldier. And Paul wants to point out to us that we can have friends that are so close to us, we're like brothers, like fellow soldiers, serving the faith, serving Jesus, that center pillar of faith, if you will, that they're like soldiers. They do what we are told to do. They complete the mission no matter what is required. And Paul's like, hey, here's my thank you note. When Epaphroditus makes it back, honor him. Honor him. Now, we do that similar to our soldiers nowadays. This is a picture of a, of a ticker tape parade for after World War II. Okay? We do that. We do parades. And, and for the most part, most of our wars, when we bring back our soldiers, we honor them. Okay? But that is something that Paul tells the church in Philippi to do. This person is so close to me. He's my brother, my brother in the faith. And he's brought to me sustenance and your good letters to me to build me up to spin my plate, to keep it from wobbling, and I want you to take him back, and when you get him back, throw a party for him. Okay? Because that is how close he is to me. That's what he means to me. That's what you mean to me. Right? That's Epaphroditus. So if we think about it, Paul's got his strong pillar of faith, but even... At times, like all of us, our strong pillars of faith, our plate's not stable. It's still spinning. It's still wobbling. It's still got friction happening in us. But he's got two other things that, the, that God has kind of inspired, and that's the idea of the friends. A friend so close that he can call a son, and a friend so close that he can call a brother, a fellow soldier. Now, if we close our Bibles right there, hoo That's it, right? Why? Why would we have that passage in the Scripture, Right? And I'll be honest with you, that's where I was. I was struggling. I was struggling to figure out how in the world that passage was applicable. You know, Paul's got his faith. Paul's got two friends. We had an elders meeting about three weeks ago. And at the elders meeting, we always have a chance to kind of share. And Pastor Gary shared with us his New Year's resolutions. And his New Year's resolution, one of his New Year's resolutions, was to start what we would call a triad. It was a way to bring other pastors from the area together and kind of start a close community, this close bonding kind of thing. Not daily, but routinely, so that you can look on each other and you can have each other build. You can keep your plate spinning because you can share community. You can share bonding. You can develop friendships so close that they be like family. Well, I'm not sure that was the Holy Spirit poking me or whether it was Pastor Gary that was poking me. But when I opened this pastor of scripture to start figuring out what I was going to say, um, which was shortly after that meeting, uh, I was like, wow, it's pretty obvious. Now, I'll be honest with you. I don't got it. I don't have a triad. And I'm not sure that at the time I was ready to kind of even think about getting a triad. You know what I'm saying? But it doesn't take very much for us to start reading about what Paul had. Paul's in prison at the risk of being killed and he's talking about faith and friends so close that he gives them family names saying that's the importance of a triad i kind of like to think that well wait a second i have my own triad i mean sure i have my own triad right we all have triad. i mean i have i'd like to point out at least i like to pretend like i point out that i have my wife as my number one pillar right she is my strength so she's my triad close but she's my triad right well that's true 
She has been around for me so many times in the past to keep me spinning upright, to add a little bit of energy back in when I start to get unbalanced, right? But the scripture is pretty clear that iron sharpens iron. And what Paul is talking about is a friend so close that you can share. There are some things that couples don't share, right? So my excuse of my wife is my triad doesn't really work. Not only is it only one other person, my faith and my wife, it doesn't kind of get to the idea of iron sharpening iron, the kind of close friend that I can discuss. So then I like to make the other excuse, and I love this excuse. Well, I'm a military commander, and if the military wanted me to have a triad, it would have issued me a triad. <laughs> if God wanted me a triad, he would have issued me a triad. That's an excuse that doesn't work, right? The idea of being a fellow soldier the idea of being having somebody that would be there to kind of rely on saying, is true in the military, but it's mostly it's truly true in what the Bible says. The example that Paul gives us is an example that we can all use. But it's not the only example in the Bible, right? Let's go to Jesus, for example. Jesus had his own triad. Peter, James, and John. John, the disciple that Jesus loved. Peter, the fisherman termed impromptu soldier. What happens when they go to arrest Jesus, right? What does he do? He grabs the soldier's sword and chops off an ear, right? Okay. Jesus had a small circle. Sure, he had a large following. As a matter of fact, if you look at the uh, Gospels, only two of the Gospels are written by somebody inside of Jesus. The rest of them are written by outside. People that were there with him as first-hand accounts, but they weren't part of his twelve. But inside of his 12 disciples, he had an inner circle, Peter, James, and John, that he took to like the transfiguration, that he took to the Garden of Gethsemane and prayed with. Granted, they fell asleep, but he prayed with. That was his inner circle. That was Jesus' triad. Okay? So if I can say an excuse of having, well, I have my wife and I'm a commander, that's military. That's, that's not a valid excuse. In addition, Paul, I already mentioned Silas. Paul had previous triads. Early in Paul's ministry, he has another person that's very, very young with him called John Mark. And he's got Barnabas and he's got Silas. Okay? Those were all part of his inner group, his close friends. Now, triads aren't perfect. Jesus' triad, what happened the same night that Peter became the soldier? The same night, he denies Jesus three times. He turns coat and denies Jesus three times. So triads aren't perfect. Nobody is perfect, especially not me. Nobody's perfect, okay? The same thing is true for Paul. When Paul has his early triads, he's got a falling out with John Mark, what would have been really his first son. And he's got a falling out with Barnabas, what would have really been his first soldier. But that's okay. See? Sometimes things don't go quite perfect, but it doesn't take us away from the idea of trying to look for triads, trying to look for somebody that is so close to us that can keep our pillar of faith and help us when our plate starts to wobble. That's the, that's the example that we have. So when Pastor Gary brought this out, I keep pointing, because that's where he normally sits, but when Pastor Gary brought this out to us in the elders' meeting, um, I kind of was convicted. What do I do? Mark doesn't, have, Mark doesn't have a triad. And I'm not sure what the Holy Spirit's telling me, whether it's supposed to be that I will be a mentor for somebody else, like a son, or I will be the son for somebody who's senior me to mentor. I don't know. And I don't know whether I'm supposed to get a soldier from inside of the faith or outside of the faith. Somebody who doesn't have the same belief in Christ, maybe I'm supposed to lead that person. I don't know. But I do know that I need a triad. I do know, if you go to the next slide for me, that all of us need triads. We all need somebody that not only upholds the pillar of faith, or not only, that not only can help us keep our pillar of faith, saying, but we need friends that are so close to us that we can call family. And so from the standpoint of frontline, we are a real relational group. That's our model, real relational group. If you're interested in doing a triad, I'm saying we're interested in trying to get them started. Okay. I don't have the answers, but I do know that we have ideas. Right? And that's what we're kind of looking for. And that's men and women. Okay? This principle applies equally to both. It's the idea of having somebody who can be a friend so close to you that you would give them 
that you would consider them family, okay? The idea that you would do something so much for them that they would restore your faith, that they would keep your plate when your plate is wobbling from falling off a pillar of faith, okay? That's the idea of a triad, okay? And that's kind of where we are. Now, in the next few minutes, we're going to have the prayer team come up here and kind of prayer. And, and, and before I want to close, I want to show you this, just the idea, the concept that we're kind of developing. So if you go to the last slide for me, this is the big idea, right? We overcome life's frictions. We keep our plate spinning by our faith in, in Christ and by our friends that we would call family. That's what we're talking about when we think about a triad. I don't know what it looks like necessarily. Saying, I just know that Paul had one. Jesus had one. I bet you Mark can have one too. Right? right? So if that's something that's interesting to you, come seek us. Come find people. Come up front. You know what I'm saying? Right? Because we are a real and relational group. We don't have answers. We have people seeking answers. Right? Let me close in a word of prayer. Dear God, just thank you so much for today. Thank you so much for just the example you have, from not only your son, but also the example from Paul. Unshakable faith, but still, even in the situations where your life has got you by the throat, the idea that you would give us friends, friends so close that we can call them family, sons, brothers, soldiers, friends that want to go with us to accomplish the mission that you have, that you're working out through us. We ask you to kind of help us develop this idea. We ask you to kind of help us encourage each other. And most importantly, we ask you to empower us to go out this door and to serve you to further your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. Have a great day. You say, enjoy your day, enjoy your week. And the prayer team will be up here if you'd like to have any questions.